bunch of numbers. Actually, I'm not going to write them down. I'm just going to show you what I have written down. I'm going to make you write them down. It's kind of mean of me. Alright, so that's the second payment, obviously just from the other side. And look, I write really fast. Three pictures getting surgery on their elbows. You had the brake spans in there? September, is that 1060? Yeah, 1060. Alright, so there's a couple things I need to say about this. So obviously each one of these lines would be a new journal entry for each side, just like we've done previously. Um, the interest gets reduced all the way through until it comes down to a very small amount as we get down to the very end. The very last payment of 43033, pay to the last of the interest expense, pay out the rest of the principal, there's nothing left when you make our last payment. So there's no journal entry at the end, because the last payment is the last journal entry, because there's nothing left. When you make when you make that final journal entry. Once again, the primary purpose for doing this here is because we're going to see the same kind of same kind of uh, pattern when we get to leases again. And having seen it here, we'll make it easier when we get to leases next week. bottom of the page it says decision makers perspective we're going to skip so the 
Not the other test. Alright, so what we have left in this chapter are basically four variations to the things we've already seen. Um, so we're going to deal with some things that could happen after issuance, um, and we're going to deal with um, one example of something that happens at the same time as, as issuance, but a variation from what we've already seen. And are we ready to flip the page? Pretty good. So the first thing we're going to deal with is early extinguishment of debt. So this is, we issue debt, and then we, de we decide that we're going to, in some way, extinguish the debt, pay it back. And there's a variety of ways of paying that back. Um, debt can be retired early by either being called or by open market purchases. Uh, obviously, you have to have callable debt for it to be called. To be called basically means within the contract, the debt covenant, it says that at a, during a particular period of time, we're allowed to go back to the people that lent us the money and say, we're going to pay this back, and, and the contract is going to say at what rate we have to pay it back at. So that's, that means being called, calling the debt, paying it back early. Or potentially, we could just go to those people that lent us the money and say, hey, we'd like to pay you back now. And they say, okay, this is the amount we're willing to accept right now. That would be an open market purchase. If it's a bond, they have bond markets, you could just go, just like anyone else would buy a bond, and you can repurchase your own shares, is basically what, it's the same thing. Um, so an open market purchase, uh, all commonly done. Uh, debt retired before maturity may result in a gain or loss on extinguishment. The value requires that the gain or loss be classified in the income statement as an extraordinary item only if the situation meets the unusual criteria of being both unusual and infrequent. In other words, never. It's always going to be part of your normal operations. Um, so when we do this, the gain and the loss are early extinguishment. Oh, I already have the answer. Stop looking at the answers. Look at the blank page. <laughs> Were you writing that down? Who was writing that down? That's okay. You don't do much. What's that? You don't do much good. We still got to listen to it. That's true. That's true. You need to. That, and that's, that's, to be honest, why I don't have it there. It's because the, as I write it down, you can see where I got the numbers from. And yeah, that's the idea. Uh, so gain and loss on early extinguishment is the cash proceeds minus the book value. Or in other words, cash proceeds is the same thing as the fair value, and this is the book value. So gain or loss is always going to be the fair value compared to the book value of the thing being sold. And that's always true for every, in every case, and that's true here as well. All right, example six, early extinguishment of debt. On July 22nd, 2010, Horrible Inc. called its 2 million 8% bonds when their carrying value was that amount. So in other words, on July 22nd, when they called it, call it meaning paying it back early within the contract that says they can do this. Um, on that date, the carrying value, meaning the face value of 2 million and obviously a what does it have to be? Premium or discount? Discount. It has to be a discount, right? Because it's less than the face amount. This has to be a discount. There's no way this is a premium. So minus the premium equals this number right here. The indenture specified a call price of 1.9 million. In other words, in the contract it says, within this time period, we're obviously within it, otherwise we couldn't do this, we can pay this back for $1.9 million. That's what the contract says, and that's what we're going to do. The bonds were issued previously to, at a price to yield 10%. In other words, this is the market rate of interest. This is the stated rate of interest. Um, all those things continue to be true. So what we're going to do is we're going to record the journal entry for the early extinguishment of this debt. When we call the debt, what does that journal entry look like? So first of all, excuse me, we know how much we're going to pay to, to get rid of this debt. 1.9 million. So we're going to have some stuff up here. So we're going to follow the bottom a credit to cash of 1.9 million. We know that's how much we have to pay to pay this thing off. The other thing we know is the amount that the bond payable is currently on our books for, and that is going to be the face value, which is $2 million. 
And then we can figure out how much discount we have by, by looking at the current carrying amount. The carrying amount of 1.1927870 is the 2 million minus the discount. So this minus this equals our discount. So if you take this minus that, you are going to get a discount of 72130. Okay, so let's think about, we are crediting this discount because it's currently a debit. How do I know it's a debit? Because it's the opposite side of our bond payable. Okay, debits have to equal credits, uh, so we're going to need an additional 27,870 on this side, and that's going to be a gain on early extinguishment of the debt. 27,870 is our gain when we sell this thing, I mean, excuse me, when we repurchase our debt, when we call our debt early, when we extinguish our debt. There we go. So we get rid of the bond payable, we get rid of the discount associated with the bond payable, we record the cash that we receive, and the gain or loss for the difference. And how did you compute right. the discount again? This is the 200,000 minus the 1927870 equals, I'm sorry, 72130. This is the carrying value, excuse me. This is the, help me, what's the word I'm looking for? Face, face value, there we go. It is the face value. This is the carrying value, so the difference has to be the amount face of the discount. What, what is the, uh, the difference between the 8% and the 10%? The 8% is the stated rate, and the 10% is the market rate. Uh, in this particular example, we don't need those at all. They're not helpful in the problem. So how do we know when there's a loss in this case? Um, two ways. First, debit equal credits. It's a credit. Yeah. So it has to be a gain. The second way is this right here. Gain or loss on an early extinguishment. The cash proceeds, which is 1.9 million, minus the book value, and the book value is this number, 1927870. And so the difference, which is 27,870, um, that difference, which is the same number as our gain, and if the cash proceeds are smaller, then it's going to be a gain, and if they're bigger, it's going to be a loss. This is the exact opposite than if we're dealing with an asset. This is a liability. We want to pay less for this thing. And so if we pay less than what we owe, that's a gain. We pay more than we owe, it's a loss. Are we going to do the other side too? Uh, not, in, not in this example, but we could pretty easily. It would basically be everything opposite of this. Um, debit a discount for the same amount, um, debit a loss for the same amount, because they're going to get less back than what their asset looks like, debit the cash, credit the investment. We won't do it, but you could. Pretty easily. So the call price is like the whenever at that particular time they just say it's the one point you have to pay back one point nine million. That's right. In the contract it says you can pay it back for this amount as of this date. It's usually not an actual amount. It's usually using some kind of interest rate that is current. Because uh, the reason that you have debt that is callable is to protect the person borrowing the money so that they can pay it back if interest rates go down significantly so they can borrow at a lower rate. So oftentimes it's going to be associated with the, the going interest rate. But sometimes it's just a, a static number like what we just did. Does that make sense? Is it always safe to assume that this was um, a discount, issued a discount because the carrying value is less than the face? Yes, it has to be. Yeah. Oh, you also know it from the interest rates. The market rate is 10, the rate is 8. Okay. You know it's also discount that way. But yeah, just from that, you know it's a discount. If this number was greater than 2 million, you know you had a premium. Any other questions on early extinguishment of bonds? 
All right, convertible bonds. When I get here, I always want to make some kind of joke with James Bond with the car, but I'm not going to. <laughs> convertible bonds. Some bonds may be converted into common stock at the option of the holder. So this is different. With the callable debt, the person that issued it gets to make a choice to call it. With convertible bonds, the investor gets to make a decision. Do I want to change these bonds into something else? It's usually into equity. So some bonds may be converted into common stock at the option of the holder, the investor. When bonds are converted, the issuer updates interest expense and, am and amortization of discounted premium to the date of conversion. So they update everything to that date. The bonds are reduced and shares of common stock are increased. The value of the conversion is not accounted for separately. All right. This last sentence we'll come back to in a second because it will become relevant when we do our next problem. All right. Example seven, convertible bonds. At the beginning of 2010, this company issued $5 million, 8% convertible ventures due 2015 at 102. All right, so this is a, a convention that I don't think we've talked about here in class. When something is says it's issued at 102, does anyone know what that means? <coughs> the book uses it. Has anyone is read this? Is it a premium? It is a premium, it's, um, specifically. Like 102%. 102% of the face value, very good. So the textbook uses this, and, and we'll use it occasionally as well. So in other words, it was issued at a premium at 102% of the five million. So 102% of this is the amount that, of cash that it was issued for. The bonds pay interest annually, not semi-annually. The bonds are convertible at the option of the holder into common stock at a conversion ratio of 25 shares for $1,000 bond. So in other words, if you invest in this and you have a $1,000 bond, you can say, I would like to trade this $1,000 bond for 25 shares of common stock. And you can do that at your discretion. Or I just hold the $1,000 bond. It's up to me. The common stock has a $1 par value. All right. Uh, so let's first record the journal entry at issuance. So the 102% of the $5 million, we are going to have cash of five million one hundred thousand. So five million oops times one hundred and two percent equals five million one hundred thousand. Have a bond payable. And, and we're only going to do this from the side of the issuer, not of the investor as well. We have a bond payable of five million dollars and we have a premium All right, so that's the issuance. Um, and then on January 1st, 2011, exactly one year later, one fourth of the holders of the convertible debentures exercise their conversion option. So the first thing we need to do is we need to realize that on December 31st, um, there was a payment made that we need to do the journal entry for. So let's go ahead and do that first, and then we will deal with the conversion one day later. Um, if, there was not a, if, if there was not a journal entry performed the day previously, we need to do another journal entry right before we did this to record all of the amortization up to that point. Um, but we're making it easy by making it January 1st. So, just like we've done so many times, we're going to go ahead and record this first payment. Um, it's going to be 5 million times 8%, um, which is going to give us our cash payment of 400,000. We are going to have interest expense that is going to be equal to the carrying value of 5.1 million multiplied by the market rate of interest, which is uh, not given to us. I'll tell you it's 7.5%. I should just add that to the problem, which will make my life easier. 7.5%, which is going to give us 382,500. And then we're going to amortize our premium of 17,500. So this is another example of with the 102%, you could solve for the 7.5%.
Um, but again, you need a financial calculator to be able to do it. So I'm just going to give it to you here, and we're going to use it to get that interest expense. What is the name of this event office? That is the market rate of interest. That's the Where? That's the Correct. I guess. I just gave it to you. Yes. Pretend like it's in the paragraph. You are correct. Thank you for that. Yes, put a big circle around that. Professor Blunt gave it to me. All right, because the key part that we really want to focus on is this part down here. On January 1st, 2011, one fourth of the holders of the convertible debenture exercised their conversion option. So that means that one fourth of this five five thousand sorry five million dollars. is going to go away. And so we're going to get rid, and we have four entries here, so we're going to have to go over this 11 here. We're going to get rid of the bond payable that we had previously of 1,250. Sorry, 1,250,000. Does everybody see why that's the amount we're getting rid of? Or in other words, we issued this, people gave us cash, and then the investors came back and said, we don't want these bonds anymore. We're going to give them back to you. This is the amount we're going to give back. In exchange, you're going to give us some of your shares of common stock. So we need to record that as well. The other thing we need to do is that there is premium associated with these bonds. And so when we get rid of the bonds, we need to get rid of the premiums associated with them as well. The current amount of our premium is the 100,000 minus the 17,500, which is 82,500, and one fourth of those are going to go away. So that's going to be 20,625. So we also need to get rid of premium of 20,000. 625. Are we okay with that number? Any concerns? The last thing we need to do is we need to record what we're giving up. So we, we no longer have this liability or this premium, which adds to the liability. But instead, we are issuing shares of stock. And so, um, you've probably learned this in the past. I don't know for sure if you have. How much goes into your common stock account? Anybody know? Par value. Par value times? Number of, stock. Number of shares. Very good. So all we're going to do is we're going to take the par value of $1 per share. We need to figure out how many shares just got converted. Or not converted. How many, how many bonds got converted? Therefore, how many shares did we have to give up? So how many bonds got converted is going to be the 1,250,000 divided by 1,000 to make it so that it's 1,250 $1,000 shares. I keep saying these wrong. 1,250 $1,000 bonds got converted. So this is the number of $1,000 bonds. Does everybody see that? And for, no. Say again? No. Okay. So this is the amount of the, the face amount of bonds that are being converted. Mm -hmm. And they're $1,000 bonds each. So if you take this divided by 1,000, we get 1,250. So that's the number of $1,000 bonds. And for each one of those, we are giving them 25 shares of stock. So we take this number, multiply it by 25, and that gives us our 31,250 shares of stock that we are giving out to the people that converted. Does that make sense? Multiply that by a one dollar par value, and the, the amount that goes in the common stock account is going to be thirty-one two fifty. 
Where's the rest go? Nope. APEC. <coughs> Say again. APEC. What does APEC stand for? Additional payment capital. Additional payment capital. That would be great. Um, I, I usually just do PIC payment capital, but additional payment capital would be just fine as well. So pay in capital, which is going to be everything else. So this plus this minus this equals one million two thirty nine three seventy five. Uh, everything in excess of par. So those are the oh, both of these are shareholders' equity accounts. Okay. Essentially, you can take common stock, additional paid capital, lump them together if you're ever looking at common stock. Because it's really just lump them together. It's kind of a relic of things we used to do in the past, which we don't do anymore, but it's still there. Any questions on anything in that problem? Yeah, why would they want to do that? Yeah, if the value of the equity has gone up enough to be worth more than the $1,000 bond, that's when you want to do it. So you get convertible stock in the hopes that the value of the equity goes up so you can convert it and have something more valuable than just the $1,000 bond. But in this case, it's not. Um, in the, in, well, we, we don't have fair values anywhere here. So the assumption is yes, oh, okay. it is. Otherwise, they wouldn't do it. Yeah, that's the assumption. All right. Um, this problem um, is going to be compared to our next problem. It has some similarities, uh, but one distinct difference. 